gentleman yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Thank you. And uh, so one of the reasons I ran for Congress 16 years ago was uh, the high level of uh, reliance on foreign fuel to fuel our economy and wanted to change that. So I'm pleased to see that we are down to 33 percent. Uh, we're only 33 percent of our fuel needs or oil is imported now. So in a geopolitical sense, why do we still have 33 uh, percent uh, import of oil into our country? And I'll start with Mr. Mr. Siminski. Uh, Mr. Terry, it's, it's I mean, the, what we're talking about mostly here today is oil, but uh, within a, a year and a half, the U.S. is likely to be a net exporter of natural gas. We are already a net exporter of coal. Uh, we don't uh, really import very much electricity. A little bit of that comes from Quebec and, and Canada and from Saskatchewan. So on the oil side, we're a net exporter of oil products. Uh, the only thing that we're still importing is crude oil, and uh, those numbers right. are, will come down if you say, well, do you want that to go to zero? And the answer would be, well, not necessarily. Well, because, that's, that's the ultimate question here is, can, can we and import we? oil and sell products? And particularly Venezuelan oil bothers me. Yeah, the, but the, do we have a geopolitical responsibility to allow some importation of Venezuelan oil? I don't, I'll stay away from the policy decision of <laughs> what we would want to do with Venezuela or not, but I would say that Venezuela is at the top of EIA's list of what could go wrong in the global markets. It could push prices up. You've got Iranian sanctions issues. Uh, you have the ISIS problems in Iraq. Um, maybe OPEC uh, will at some point decide uh, to reduce production. Uh, you know, you could have difficulties in Russia even. I mean, there's lots of things that make, could make prices go up, but prices could come down too. What really triggered uh, prices coming down, I believe, in the, over the course of the last few months was a combination of the unexpected recovery of oil production in Libya at the same time that the economy in China was slowing down and demand uh, forecasts began to, to recede. And, and in that background of increasing U.S. oil production, the combination of all of those things, I think, just was a tipping point and, and changed everybody's mind about what the future looked like. Well, Mr. Puglarisi. Uh, yeah, I guess you know, one of the things I would encourage the, the, the members to do is to look at this through a North American lens. When you put Canada in the mix, absolutely, we we are you know, and w w we really don't like this self-sufficiency approach to thinking about energy security. We really say, look, we want this platform to be productive. U.S., Canada, we're a large continental land, and Mexico. And Let's be, think of it as a North American yeah, independence. Yeah, and it may be efficient. It, it, uh, there may be efficient solutions for the platform, which allows both exports and imports, because. Refining configurations are all different kinds. We have a lot of very heavy capital invested in processing heavy crude. And so that heavy crude ought to come down to, from Canada and get processed. Where it's more, that, that's where it's most valuable. Well, and, and, and that makes sense to me. And so in our refining capacity in the United States, I'll follow up on, on your comment here. Uh, do we... It, are we ready to be able to expand, or do we need to expand refining capabilities in the United States if we're going to have a mix of more sweet and then the heavier crude from Canada? Who wants to go with that one? Well, it's difficult to, to convince refiners to expand capacity uh, when the demand here in the U.S. is going down. Typically, refineries are built uh, closer to where consumers are. Uh, but we've got a terrific advantage in both technology and low natural gas prices. Natural gas is used as a refinery fuel uh, that, that make our refineries uh, the best in the world. And, um, and taking advantage of, of those um, uh, situations, I, I, I think, uh, is what the refiners are doing, uh, exporting products uh, into the global market. Ms. Gordon? Yeah, I could just say that in terms of, it was said earlier, but global production has become very 
it's not site specific anymore. It's happening right. all over. But this is also going to happen in refining. The country that added more refining capacity to the world market than any other last year was Saudi Arabia. So we're seeing China adding refining capacity, Saudi Arabia adding re refining capacity, and demand, as we just said, is really in the developing world. So to move that demand closer, you know, refined products closer to, to people that will consume, we're talking Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, that's where future demand growth is throughout Asia. So the whole market is really shifting somewhat. I don't, I don't think you can really draw a circle around North America very easily in this market. Although I want to. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.